So we are a development financial institution. We're focused, our mission is to try to end poverty. Um, I think increasingly we, we're focused on how you build prosperity because that's the way that you can help uh, the poor uh, work their way out of poverty. Um, and unusually for us, we decided to publish a report, Turn Down the Heat, which is uh, a summary of the climate and science. And we did that because we're having conversations with our clients all the time. Our clients are developing nations and also the private sector. And in those conversations, we're talking about how to engineer greener growth going forward. But one of the questions that we have in that economic dialogue is, well, okay, so as we think about investment in infrastructure or agriculture, we have to think about adaptation, uh, we have to think about mitigation, but what kind of world are we planning for? Because these are long-term investments. Mm. And we found that we really didn't know what kind of world we should advise our clients to prepare for. We could have waited for the IPCC report, which is going to come out in 2014, but what we decided was a summary of the science now would help us understand uh, investment for the future. And, you know, much to our regret, and I think for everybody's regret, the report confirms that the scientific consensus is that we are on track for a four-degree world. Now, a four-degree world, as the report says, is going to be devastating, especially for the poor. Um, it, it says, for example, that 30% of the cropland in sub-Saharan Africa will be unusable. Well, I mean, there is no way that we can get uh, to zero food security if that amount of land which could be used for agricultural productivity is going to be taken out of commission. So with a focus on poverty, this really underlines that climate change is going to pull the rug from underneath us as we try to end poverty over the next few decades. Mm. And I noticed, you know, your report made it into a number of um, papers, particularly in the UK, where climate change doesn't always figure, notably um, the FT, or the, though the FT does a lot of coverage on those sort of sustainable development issues. Um, has, has publishing that, that report led for you to an, any interesting conversations with particularly developed world countries? Yeah, well, I think one of my favourite quotes from one of the British newspapers was that when Greenpeace and the World Bank agree, mm. you really need to take notice. Um, and so I think that that's... Uh, We've been quite amazed by the reaction to the report, and I think it has been this juxtaposition of an evidence-based organisation, but normally people think of that in economic terms, putting its arms around the science and saying, hey, this has to affect all of our decision-making. But also, the report coming just a few weeks after Superstorm Sandy, I think has opened up a whole new narrative about the fact that it is the poor and the vulnerable that suffer the most from the extreme weather events that come from climate volatility now. Now, traditionally, we think of the poor in Dhaka, Bangladesh. We think of the poor in the coastal cities of the world. Well, yeah, well now we have to think about the poor in Staten Island and the poor in Queens and Rockaway because it was they that suffered the most. And the elite, whether they are in the developing or the developed world, have more resilience and more ability to ride out climate change. Um, but the poor, wherever they are, won't. And that's a global coalition. That's a global coalition ready to be built. When you looked at the figures on display, um, does it suggest to you that um, particularly richer countries have got, got their maths wrong um, as, as regards where they're actually spending money in their budgets? Well, I think um, this report so sort of underlines something that we already knew from an economic point of view, which is that we are investing uh, an enormous amount of money in a sort of relief uh, to disasters uh, caused by extreme weather events. Mm -hmm. um, over the last uh, 30 years, um, we've invested uh, trillions and trillions of dollars in, um, in, uh, in relief. And actually what we need to start doing now in earnest in the developed and the developing world is invest in preparedness and resilience. Um, and we know that for every dollar invested in resilience, you can save four dollars in relief. Well, these are the kinds of um, changes of focus within economic planning that can produce real savings and then that money can simply be redeployed into mitigation efforts or to other adaptation efforts. So we think that that's something that both the developed and the developing world should really be thinking about now. You know, How do you switch the focus from relief to preparedness and, and prevention? And I'm sure the World Bank deals with, with um, huge sums of funds, a clear concern um, amongst um, particularly the richer nations is that those funds um, which they're giving in, in terms of climate finance are you know transparent in terms of where they're being paid is is that from your perspective is that still still an issue well I think I think transparency is going to be fundamental 
uh, to the kind of trust that has to be built between developed and developing countries in the context of the convention, but also more generally. Um, we will be announcing actually tomorrow that all of the multilateral development banks have agreed uh, the, the ways to categorize what is a climate smart investment, whether that's in agriculture or infrastructure, so everybody can compare apples for apples and see what we are doing as multilateral development banks. Last year, for our own account, using our own balance sheets, we invested 20 billion as a community in, in climate activities. The World Bank manages $7 billion worth of, of fast start finance through the climate investment funds. Again, the transparency, not only of what we're investing in, but the impact that we're achieving through that investment becomes very important. And as an MDB community, we're able to do that. It seems because you released this report ahead of this conference that you still have um, uh, an element of a level of faith in this process. But um, when you talk to your private sector partners that you deal with, do you sense that they are as interested in this conference anymore and in, and in this process or are they um, as I think Ivo de Boer said recently they're just getting on with um, you know preparing for the future and not worrying about what governments are doing I think I think we've seen since Copenhagen building through Cancun Durban here that um, that both the private sector is just getting on with it because they see where their where their interest lies mm. but you're also seeing governments also forming coalitions of like-minded countries, uh, moving on issues which are important. So for example, short-lived climate pollutants, that's black carbon, methane, HFCs. There's a coalition now of 38 countries working with us and UNEP uh, and other organizations just marching ahead, not waiting for a global convention. Where We are committed multilateralists, we're a multilateral development bank. Where we need global consensus, is in establishing a carbon price. You know, if we had a carbon price, that would just make things a lot easier. But in the absence of global action, people will go another route. And so you see uh, national uh, schemes, uh, carbon trading schemes, carbon emission schemes uh, setting up. And what we're trying to do is make sure that each of those are interoperable so that you can get to a global market. So maybe from the bottom up, you can force a, a global carbon price. So I think we have to, ha we have to have faith in the global, the global deal because if we got a global deal that would make things much easier mm -hmm. but we can't afford to wait and we're not waiting.